Welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm Kevin Cruz. I'm the founder and CEO of LeadX. At LeadX, we're on a crazy mission to spark the next 100 million leaders around the world. That's a big number. We can't do it alone. We need your help. And uh, even though LeadX sponsors this monthly community of practice, it's not a user group meeting. You don't need to be a customer to be here. We don't do demos. LeadX people stay out of the breakouts just so you can have a great uh, unbiased conversation. And in fact, we don't allow coaches or consultants or others like that um, in just so there, there isn't any of that commercial bias, you know, in, in all of this, uh, all this time we're spending together. We have a great agenda as always here. We, in a few minutes, are going to introduce uh, the author of the new book, You're the Leader. Now what? It's not that new. I mean, we, I wrote about it in Forbes just recently. Great book. And uh, then we're going to talk about um, showing impact, ma manager impact. What are we holding managers accountable for with uh, someone many of you have already met um, from Duck Creek? And so much of this is really about the conversation in the chat. So keep your fingers warm. We've got a mastermind group here. We are all friends and family, extended family. So let's keep that alive. And in the breakouts, it's going to be your chance to meet new people, to build your network. I say it every time, none of us should be so busy in our job that we neglect our career. So congratulations on investing in your, in your career here today. So thank you. I love this vibe too. Um, and <laughs> hey, I've got to introduce, you see him all the time when he's not running sales training at Hologic. He's doing MMA refereeing and all kinds of other crazy travels. My partner in crime, the Dwayne Bass. I got it right this time, Dwayne. <laughs> That's right. OH, my friend. I love it. <laughs> hey, I didn't see if you typed an answer. What's your, uh, what is your internal weather like today, Dwayne? You know, Sharknado. I'm just trying to get, kill it and get things done right now before I go into the weekend. Yes, yeah, so you're having, is it just one of those days or one of those weeks? I think just one of those weeks, you know, but, but in a good way, in a good way, you know, so yeah. we're definitely eat what we're killing right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I feel similar. It's like uh, Sharknado with a chance of snakes on a plane or something, you know, it's just uh, <laughs> not sure it could get <laughs> uh, a you know, it's just pretty spicy. I, I'm always telling everyone, of course, like I'm a massive introvert. So I try to balance out my schedule a little bit. Today, thankfully, I still did my workouts, Dwayne, you'd be proud, still hit the gym in the morning, but I'm doing two uh, Forbes interviews with chief nice. people officers. I'm doing this session. I'm doing the webinar, how to write your own bestseller at 6 p.m. my time. So it's like, and there's other things that just stacked. So it's like, okay, a lot of Sharknado, yeah. one hour at a time, one obligation at a time. And of course, these are all blessings, right? You're always reframing it. I, I these are, it's, it's a blessing to be this busy. You know, it's a blessing to be able to do all these things. Yeah. And the launch of your book finally, right? Yeah, that was this week. Um, and it's, yeah. uh, it's going well. I'm not doing as much. Um, it's the 11 secrets successful people know about goal setting. Um, and yeah. it, it's going well. I'm not doing the crazy number of like podcast interviews I used to do just no, no time. Um, but right. I've, I, it's, it's one of those things, Dwayne, where like, this sounds corny, but like, I want to, sure. I want a lot of people to read it, but already I've been getting some emails back, including from many, many of you, um, who have talked very specifically about, oh, I just changed my goals in this way. Oh, I appreciated you being vulnerable and sharing this story. And that means a lot. Like you just right. want to have a positive impact. So it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Are you going to turn that into uh, one of the PDFs that you typically do for 12 weeks? Of <laughs> I, I should, I guess. I mean, we have a little bit of goal setting content, of course, in the LeadX app, but we should have a whole lot more now that you say it, given we got a whole book on it. So yeah, one, <laughs> Kevin Thomas, we need a one pager. That's right. Who wants, who wants the big PDF? We want the one pager. Um, nice. That's great. Hey, Matthew Painter, I see you there. Hey, Dwayne, I want to dive into this because we have such a full thing and check out. So this is pretty cool. Yeah. Talking about cool things and giveaways. So many of you know, we launched Innovating Leadership Development Magazine with the first issue. We're very busy with the second issue. Um, if you, you don't know that we have this Leadership Development Magazine, you'll get a copy as part of 
a member now of the community of practice, but hot off the press, Dwayne, we got a new podcast. We, we, well, we haven't officially launched it. All of you are the first to hear. This just came out in the last 48 hours. New podcast called The Culture Code, where I'm interviewing, well, I'm not even going to describe it because Evan's the one that gets all the, does all the work on this. Evan, tell us <laughs> what is going on with this culture code. How come this is all brand new? Yeah, so um, we just launched it two days ago, and there's sort of three types of episodes that you'll see uh, on the podcast. So the first is in response to people who missed meetings for the community of practice, we decided to add recordings, uh, like edited recordings that uh, of each community meeting. So as of now, we just have the most recent two uploaded from June and July, and we'll upload mm -hmm. August next week. And then the second type of episode that we're running is Kevin's interviewing chief people officers, um, like a madman, like three to five a week. So we're uploading wow. those and dropping Forbes articles that pair with them. And then the third is the Kevin rant. So that's when uh, he'll do like a five to seven minute talk about different topics. Uh, like this three to one is the new model for learning as an example. Hey, Evan, I'm just now noticing you, you're literally now officially calling it a rant. That used to be like yeah. our funny thing. Oh, Kevin's got a rant on LinkedIn. Now you're calling it a rant, which is good. It's an official label now. It's an official <laughs> label. And then the other thing I thought was fun. <laughs> now, Evan, this might be over the top. Look, this is from a community meeting, right? This episode is a leaked event from our private members only community of practice. <laughs> you're going over the top on some of this sizzle. <laughs> yeah, we thought, well, I thought a lot of people wish they were in the community. Uh, That's true. But we, we keep it members only. So I thought uh, we could at least leak it out through the podcast to people who want to listen in. Yeah, that's great. Lynn says it increases the intrigue. Um, <laughs> so Evan, so again, like uh, you're adding the a block of episodes before we officially announce it. But right now, um, what's the best way for people to find it? Like if they search on Spotify, the culture code, the word the right. seems to be important right now. You can find it there, right? Right. Like yeah. Spotify and I'm a, uh, here, I'll drop the link in the chat right now. So this so, is the Spotify link, but it's oh, cool. also on basically every channel that you could so listen wherever, to podcast If you're a on. podcast listener, then find this on the favorite place you you do it and and again like it might not show up right away we just dropped this in the last day or two and so um but give it a follow that's the that's the ask if you can follow this listen to the episodes let us know what you think um but we're excited and hey Dwayne I'm frankly wondering like shouldn't like we got a magazine we got a monthly thriving cop now we've got a podcast shouldn't this be coming out at ATD or Sherm or CLO like what the heck? Why is it up to us to like do this right? I know, right? <laughs> well, you know what? You're definitely doing it right. And I'm looking forward to the three to one modeling. And I'm a fan of it. You know, I'd love to, I'm anxious to see what you have to say about it, Kevin. Cool. Well, it's going to be there. One last giveaway before we um, bring on our guest. So for those of you who are new, every month we like to give away some intellectual property. Now we know all those other great favorite leadership development vendors you use like to charge you $195 per PDF, <laughs> per, per PowerPoint slide kit. We just want to start giving away things all the time. So you really responded strongly to the Strengths Finders, the Clifton Strengths book we gave away. This month we're giving away this 12-week uh, interactive coaching self-coaching guide for everything disc we are now of course we have lead x disc we are also an everything disc provider and we always say you might want to grab a copy of this in two ways so for two reasons one you've got the right to just send this to all of your employees so if you use disc and it's been a while since they've been through a live workshop you can send this to them or you can just kind of see the design to get inspired for your own uh pull through things so for example here, you can see we count down the 12 weeks at the top, you know, this week one, which words and phrases uh, associated with your dominant disc style resonate with you? What's your behavior? And these are all fillable, you know, so you can fill it out online. Um, activity two, think about the project you led or a problem you solved. How'd you use disc style in those situations? And so we go through and it's sort of like 
remember, we want to keep things sticky. We want to overcome the knowing doing gap. We want to help people to apply these things. Old model, you do the disc, you go to the workshop and the PDF, whoops, sits on the shelf, right? The PDF sits on the shelf. This will help you to um, incorporate it on the job week by week. And of course, if you have the LeadX app, you can get the nudges uh, in the palm of your hand as well. So Evan, are we still just saying, look, if you want it, just say, give it to me, want it. Give me that disc thing. Just put a comment in and we'll send it to them, right? Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> All right, cool, cool. Uh, yeah, disc is so popular that we just figured whether it's for yourself, your team members, just, um, just use this use this. So, all right, let us dive into the meat and potatoes of the, of the session. Um, I'm really excited because uh, it's been a while. This is like my excuse to connect with some of my new friends. He is a practicing emergency physician at Mayo Clinic and the director of leadership development for the Mayo Clinic Care Network. He's also a Wall Street Journal bestselling author of the book, You're the Leader, Now What?, Please welcome Dr. Richard Winters. Richard, thanks. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, I'm going to um, actually stop my share. So this was, we first met when your book came out and I interviewed you for the Forbes article, which was fantastic. And we've got deep in a lot of things. It's been nice to um, sort of stay connected on Twitter, you know, a little bit, um, not often enough. But I think a lot of people are going to be surprised. So I want to start with, you're still a practicing physician and you're doing leadership development. So tell us about that. Yeah. So half my time is, is taking care of patients. And so I just worked last night. I'm actually on call today and through the weekend. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, still taking care of patients. The nice thing uh, about that is, uh, and, and from, for Mayo Clinic, any of our leaders who are overseeing patient care are still seeing patients. It's a big part of the organization. Um, and so then the other half, I, I'm divided between, I'm chair of finance. We have 21 emergency departments, so I oversee that. And then uh, another 30% is spent on leadership development. And, and so we have the Mayo Clinic Care Network, where I help. We have all these organizations that we partner with throughout the, the world. And I help develop leaders there and then also coach leaders internally. Now, what point in your career did you decide, okay, I'm, I really like coaching you are an icf certified coach yeah. i really like teaching others about leadership like how did that come to be so i was taking care of patients and you know one by one and feeling uh good about it but then seeing opportunities for improvement and then uh, someone was like well then you should go to the meeting and talk about this this idea you have and then i go to the meeting <clears throat> and i see people uh who are talking about and hear people who are talking about things from the perspective of business uh very different from taking care of patients and so then I ended up getting an MBA because, you know, they're a different language. And so during it was during my MBA program that I was exposed to coaching. I went to the University of Texas at Dallas. And as I started hearing about coaching before, I thought it was um, like, tell me about your feelings and kind of dream catchers. And I don't know if anyone remembers like the coaching conferences that you used to go to maybe 15 years ago. There were dream catchers and mood rings. And it was very much kind of a mix between the science of coaching as we see now and, and kind of a, a blur of other things. But what I found in that was really an opportunity to think about, number one, the way I think and approach things and how I'm effective, which was one of the reasons to get into there because I was seeing areas where I wasn't as effective. And then even better to be able to help others see that. And, and so, and then, then I think about from a leadership perspective, I think about, about myself as uh, taking care of patients one at a time when I'm in the bedside. But as a, a leader and a coach, I'm actually helping individuals take care of populations of patients. And I really like the impact that that all of us here as, as coaches can have on the communities that, that we're serving. That makes sense. I want to remind everyone, of course, and especially for the, the first timers here. So if you're on this call, you're going to get a free copy of Dr. Winter's book, You're the Leader, Now What? So if you haven't already received it within the next week or something, you're going to get a copy of this book. Um, uh, of course, we would love for you to go out and buy more copies for your colleagues. Uh, the, um, this is really a celebration and a teaser, you know, for, um, for the book. And also please feel free to type your questions for Dr. Winters in the chat. We'll keep an eye on those. I know we have a lot of health systems usually represented here, so don't be shy. I'm sure there's some extra interest there. And, um, 
one of the things, so the, the song I chose for you was Balcony, um, because there's one, one of the concepts is that I really liked you, you write about is the need for leaders to get off the dance floor and get up into the balcony. So what, what do you mean by that? Yeah. And, and so I borrowed that from Ron Heifetz and that's where I first heard about it. And so I think this is, there's this perspective where we are experts and we know what to do. I, I bet I could, I could throw a problem at you and in a moment you would know exactly what to do and you could solve it for me. Um, we can tend to go about our lives in that way. And so it's like being on the dance floor. Uh, you know, we're listening to the music and we hear what other people are saying and then we respond. We kind of predict what the next beat's going to be and we respond. And that's the life on the dance floor. As I'm taking care of patients, as I'm in a meeting and I hear someone saying something, I'm thinking, yes, I agree with you or no, I don't agree with you or, hey, we're going to talk outside. These very reflexive sort of responses that we have. And we have an opportunity to, to step up to the balcony, uh, kind of to gain a different perspective, to think about instead of in reflexively how we respond in the moment, how maybe there's other things to look at. Maybe there's other ways that we could dance, other ways that we can respond. And so very much as leaders, I think our, our goal is to get people off of the dance floor where they're just reflexively reacting and trying to get them up onto the balcony to start seeing the whole, the whole dance floor, seeing the DJ over there, seeing those individuals over there that you're not actually seeing when you're responding and then taking a moment and considering how you're going to respond and then moving forward. So for me, I use that all the time. I have, I have two daughters. They come, you know, I have all these ideas and things for them, but then I have to say, wait, get off the dance floor, get on the balcony. Let's think about this a little bit. It's, it's very helpful, not only at work, but also at home. Yeah, that's great. And I think like so many uh, great leadership lessons, it's really life is life, right? It applies anywhere there's humans, anywhere there's humans. You're getting a comment, Dr. Winters, that you have a very uh, zen looking room in the background. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I know I'm in the basement. I can actually touch the ceiling right now so that you're not <laughs> seeing that. <laughs> we have another thing in common. I have uh, beautiful spaces upstairs, and yet I'm, I always work in this windowless basement office. Right. There's just something <laughs> about my little cave that uh, is good for productivity. Yeah. <laughs> So the, the other thing that um, like so much good stuff in the book, uh, you're you're a fan of of like acronyms to help people remember things. And one of the ones I like is um, called pagers. And before I, I have you dive into that, you just a, a little excerpt. You you talk about you know we we leaders will talk about stress or resilience, but we don't really have a most of us don't really have a language to describe it. We don't really know. We're not all talking about the same thing or we don't know how to dive into it. And so you're talking about well-being and you wanted to create a model or, or a memorable uh, model to break it down into its components. So PAGERS is the acronym. I won't make you do it all. Purpose, autonomy, growth, environmental mastery, relations, and self-acceptance. Do you want to talk a little bit about that model and maybe one or two of the, of the PAGER items? Yeah, so it, so it's interesting. So I give a talk to all of our new uh, consultants, everyone who comes on at, at Mayo Physician or Scientist about burnout. And I think we're really good right now at identifying burnout. Uh, but then now what? Like, what do you do about that? And I think the difficulty that we have is, so if I gave the talk 10 years ago, how many of you have burnout? Like no one raised their hand. Mm. Now everyone raises their hand because now we have a language to talk about burnout. And so now where do we want instead? We want well-being. And so one of the things I'll do is I'll say, <clears throat> how many of you can name six causes of metabolic acidosis? And that from a physician perspective, like everyone raises their hand. How many of you can name the, the 12 cranial nerves? They all raise their hand. How many of you can name the domains of well-being? Crickets. And so we have physicians who are caring for patients who don't know the, the very domains of their own well-being, let alone those of their patients. Yeah. And so as we're trying to move away from burnout and move towards well-being, like we need a language there. And so, you know, I talk about when I was a kid, I'd go to my mom and say, hey, my tummy hurts. And my mom would be like, oh, it's, you know, that sounds bad. And I'll, and I'll go to school. <laughs> and then I go through medical school and emergency medicine training. And I'm like, mom, you know, I think there's something going on with my splenic flexure. Or maybe it's in my liver or something. Like I have a language to talk about what's going on inside. And we need to develop that with physicians about, around well-being. And so I, I, the well-being, the pagers, that purpose, autonomy, you know, personal growth, environmental mastery, et cetera, that's something that I'm thinking about as individual, as a leader, 
as um, coaching individuals. And so as we're rolling out some new process, I'm thinking about what, what effect is this going to have on the sense of, of positive relations? And how can I actually uh, create this change in a way that brings people together and, and helps to hear ideas and enhances their sense of autonomy? Because um, oftentimes we can have executive teams who, who can really get to the right um, kind of process, but is it better to bring in others so they have this sense that they're a part of things to enhance well-being for the organization overall? And also we can see things from the balcony all together that we can't see if we're on the dance floor separately. That's great. I want to um, pause for questions. Rennie, I think you had raised your hand. Did you want to um, unmute your mic? Oh, that was a uh, hand clap. I just love the the orientation and the philosophy. I mean, it's something that we hear. I'm just, I love, I love hearing it from your angle and your credentials. That's great. Thank you, Rennie. Yeah, the other thing, so everyone here is uh, in one way or another uh, responsible for or contributing to leadership development programs, and we like to think of them as systems in their organizations. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, just the, the tactics, the methodology. Are you doing your training? Is it all in person? Are these one day events? Are these, are they virtual these days? Tell us how you're doing it when you're working with physicians or other yes. healthcare practitioners. So it's whatever is needed, honestly. And so, yes, webinars, because some people come to webinars, um, it, whether it's uh, maybe it's with an executive team of an organization and I'm going there. Maybe it's uh, a, a series of uh, a program that you're delivering partially online and partially offline. I think you design it in different ways. Just first of all, depending on the audience, it's uh, easier to scale things online. And for Mayo Clinic, we have 75,000 employees. And if you're going to try to scale things, it's hard to do that all in person. You can do it online. And I really think that just as you're going to experience here, as you're having breakouts, it's a way of really bringing individuals together. Um, and then, you know, in person for other things. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's this combination. That's great. Um, Matthew Pan, I know you put a question in the chat. Do you mind taking yourself off uh, mic and you could just, you could just ask it. Yeah. So thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'm doing a lot of work with ED um, physicians um, that are happy to be in management uh, roles. And so I'm just curious to hear your perspective on what's the best way to meet those particular audience where they are, um, any best practices around that. Yeah, so for, I like to find out what are the problems that they're dealing with. That, that's, and so I, I love HBR sorts of this is a case and let's talk about this case. But I'd rather, and I do this with the programs, I'll say what are the most complex issues that you're facing right now? What are the issues right now that you disagree about? What are the things that there's some fears and worries about? And now let's discuss this. And so, and so I like to go towards something that they are dealing with right now and then help them decide how they're going to lead through that. And so just for example, as we were talking about pagers and well-being, how are we going to lead through this in a way that helps to make sure that we're enhancing well-being and not kind of burning ourselves out in the process? We're going to include that. Uh, as we, we're talking about getting on the balcony, how can we make sure as leaders that we're not just on the dance floor or just a couple of us on the balcony together? How as we're moving forward, can we bring others on the balcony? And, and from an emergency medicine perspective and from a physician perspective, and I'm going to bet from all of our perspectives, there are processes. I mean, there are frameworks that we can use that can really ground us as we're moving forward. Just as I know about pagers for well-being, it's going to help me now start to have que answers and, and questions. As I know about how do I bring people together around complex problems, it's going to help me because a lot of people just don't know how to do that. They know what they want to do. But actually, how do I do this in a way that brings people together? I think it's helping people learn the process, do it together on the problems that they're facing right now so they can see the solutions and, and practice it. Thank you for that. We've been experimenting with some group coaching that sort of um, piggybacks off of that. So thank you for your perspective. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Melanie in the chat is asking uh, um, if you can talk a little bit more about uh, scaling. You know, How do you make how do you think about learning transfer when you have 75,000, you know, potential uh, audience, you know, uh, uh, members in the organization? Um, how are you thinking about helping people to apply the remember it and apply it? Yeah. And so I think from the scaling perspective, and this is the great, I mean, geez, there's so many ways I can answer this. I think for, as you get in the senior leaders, it's much easier to bring people together in terms of the cost of bringing people together in the same room. It's, in a large organization, it's easy to, easier to do that. But that's just the top. And a lot of times from a leadership development perspective, we're focusing on that top where maybe there's some more resources from a leadership development perspective. I'm really interested in how we, from the leaders at all levels, how do we scale down there? 
And, and I think the way to do that is really uh, using things like Zoom. And so for me, and, and as I'm doing programs, and as you're doing, uh, as you're here, there's, there's nuggets of learning, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then we have breakout groups, and then 15, 20 minutes, and then we have breakout groups. The nice thing about that is, is, is that we have, we have a lot of meetings in our organizations which end up being tellings, which are we have a 60 minutes, and then, then we have five minutes each thing, and people go to it, and I'm in meetings where I haven't had any conversation with one of the other 50 participants. Like we, we're just sitting there, and we're hearing the leaders talk about the agenda. And so to be have, able to have a situation where I can actually interact with other people and learn from them, you develop programs that allow people to have breakouts and, and meet each other and network as you're doing here today. I think that is as much a key as any of the content that, that, that we're delivering is bringing people together, having them share, develop shared experience, normalizing the issues that they're facing. The, I mean, the difficulties that we're facing at my organization, I'm going to better the same difficulties that you're facing at your organization, to, but to, to normalize that and get a sense of what people are doing is, is helpful. I really like the online stuff. This is um, uh, from Anthony of Parkland Health, who uh, it's a tough question. You know, how do you get healthcare providers to make their development a priority? I think the for anyone, how do you make their development a priority is that people are uncomfortable with what's going on right now. And so how do you affect change is a, a part of self-development. And, and we all know that we've uh, shouted into the abyss at times. We've said things at meetings and not been heard. And so how do you get to be heard? How do you conduct meetings that allow people to be heard? It really comes from the pain points that individuals have. Yeah. Uh, this one comes from Krisha from Kaiser Permanente. I'm curious if you create any training for nursing leaders, any tips on how you can get their focus or priority for learning remotely, how you make the learning sticky? Yeah, I mean, so how how valuable is it if you're only training physicians? Like, <laughs> so then you have doctors who have a conversation, and then let's just say you only train nurses. Then you have all these different languages. That's the issue that, we, and and within if just marketing is getting it, uh, but then the engineers are not getting it, and and then the, people are just speaking different things. I think it's very very important that you bring multidisciplinary groups together, and this is and help help them to solve multidisciplinary problems together, and so. From a Mayo Clinic perspective, we believe in leadership dyads and triads. And so while we have physician leaders, every physician leader, every chair, for example, of a department is paired with a nursing leader and an administrative leader. And it's the three of them together that can help each other see around blind spots. It's the three of them together that as much as we can have them develop a language that is shared, it's going to help them lead the, the department together and, and be in line and to be able to deal with fears and worries together. So um, for me, I, I, I don't mind giving uh, talks just to physician groups and things, but my preference is to really have multidisciplinary groups there because that is getting people on the balcony and helping them see around each other's blind spots and um, and, and, and really getting to good solutions. Love this idea uh, of the triads. Is that common uh, in, in healthcare or is that a Mayo thing? Um, it was, it, let me say, so I practiced for 25 years outside of Mayo before I returned back. I went to med school Mayo and then I practiced for 25 years outside of Mayo. I didn't experience it where I was before, so I can only speak to my experience. Uh, at Mayo, it's, it is the way, mm -hmm. and we're seeing other high-functioning healthcare organizations where that is the way. I mean, I think, I think we all know that um, healthcare organizations and any organization can be organizations of experts, and we each have our own expertise, but it's really our ability to, to get this collective kind of group wisdom the expertise of all together that's going to help us. And so the leadership dyads and triads makes sense. It, you yeah. want multidisciplinary, multiple different perspectives and to move forward. Uh, you, we've already run over uh, our, our lot of time. I just want to do one last question, which it sounds like you're doing amazing work. As you think about the year ahead, are you thinking of any improvements or innovations or experiments you want to try in your technique or technologies just to take it to another level? Yes, yeah, so I... Um, Coaching to me is, is one of these things that how do we scale coaching and within organizations, most organizations, they can really afford it for more senior leaders. And then again, the leaders at all levels who are below, it's, it's, more, it's more difficult. And so I, I like this concept where in, I'm working on called We Coach Each Other, where we get individuals, I teach them, and, and I've been doing this, where I, I teach them how do you coach a burned out colleague? 
How do you coach a colleague um, who is up and coming and, and wanting opportunities? How do you coach uh, a, a, um, a colleague to achieve goals, for example? And so each month, giving them training about that and then having individuals coach each other and then coming back the next month. And so it's a way we can't necessarily afford a professional or executive coach for everyone, but I can teach them a level of coaching that is a little bit beyond like the one day seminar <clears throat> where people learn to coach. And then, you know, as your, is your, the, your 70, 20, you know, 10 sort of process, it, it's not just going to the course, it's actually applying things. And then, oh, you know what, this didn't go well. I was talking to them and then they weren't answering my question. What do I do? Bringing it back the next month. And, and I've done 150 individuals at once where you mm -hmm. have individuals who are coaching each other, learning together and doing breakout rooms. So I like the coaching. How do we, how do we get this more peer coaching and, and have, it, have it be kind of aided along by, by um, not just a single seminar, but a continuous thing? That's great. Doctor, thanks again for your time. Congratulations on the book. Reminder to everyone, if we have your mailing address, you'll get a physical copy of the book in uh, the mail. Doc, appreciate all, all the time and all the wisdom. Thank you, Kevin. See Thank you back you. on Twitter. Thank you, the Dwayne. Thanks. <laughs> hey, let's move into our mini case, our spotlight of the month. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the director of L&D at Duck Creek Technologies. He's up in Boston, Massachusetts. Prior to Duck Creek, he had long stints in L&D at Liberty Mutual, Citizens Bank, RBS Citizens. He's been a longtime friend of LEADX, a very early supporter, which I'm forever grateful for. His name is Bond, Darren Bond. <laughs> Welcome, That's Darren. It. Hey, thank you for having me. Okay, do you hear that Bond joke all the time? Because if I was you, I mean, I would always introduce you know, myself. Bond. It's not the Darren first Bond. time I probably heard it, but you know, I could think of worse things to be called. Hey, I was gonna say. Usually, I feel pretty good about being called Cruz Bond. I mean, that just just one ups me. You're a one upper <laughs> on the name on the name game. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> all right. So, Darren, we are gonna talk about. You know, we, we were chatting uh, earlier this week. Uh. For those of us who have been doing this stuff for, for decades, right, it, it, talking about impact, how you're measuring impact, what are you holding managers accountable for, what are they really supposed to be doing, it's a, it's a question, it's a topic that never never goes away. And often we, is even in this group, talk about, oh, measuring, do they show up for training, participation or activity, when the real thing is, like, what are our leaders, especially frontline leaders, in my opinion, what are they supposed to do, like, what are the behaviors that we want them to be doing? And so, Darren, you have been thinking a lot about this. And at Duck Creek, you just within the last year, I believe, have kind of instituted a, 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 a new move in this area. So tell us yeah. about it. Yeah, so um, my uh, my teammate Stephanie and I have been working on leadership development. So I got been with the organization two and a half years, uh, came in to lead corporate learning development. There really was no one doing that role when I joined the organization. I had to figure out like, what, is this, what does the company need? And the biggest priority obviously was getting leadership development. And we had 400 managers in six countries. And how do we get something in this vacuum of nothing going on at scale? And so partnered with LeadX to help get something out to the organization. Um, so we really just cover the basics. Like what are the fundamentals of, of a great leader? And so we focused on really core six behaviors around um, understanding your, your styles. We use DISC, we used effective feedback, coaching, how to have an effective one-on-one, -on -one, um, delegation and accountability. So like, I thought if we could like at least get these six things going, <laughs> that's 80% of the battle. Like just focus on a few things and try to just get them done well. We tracked all those things level one. So through the program, did people complete it? Did they do the activities? All that kind of stuff. And we were still just wanting to think about how do we actually know we can, we can sign off, you know, that they we, they know better, but are they yep. doing better? And that was the big question we were trying to answer and still trying to answer that question. So we um, one of the things we did last year is we uh, as we were kind of like getting through the initial 400 plus managers through this program, wanted to put out a goal. What's important you measure, just like we measure business goals, we want to measure our leadership as well. And so we wrote a goal and had it centrally loaded and we use Workday to track our goals. So we put it in Workday, called it the uh, leadership goal, and we made it as smart as we could. Um, so it would require managers to tell us and tell their manager when it came to the annual performance review on what were they doing as a leader? And so we 
simply called out uh, a few simple things we can make as smart as possible. So we said, every one of your employees, you know, help them identify and complete at least one development goal this year. Meeting with people at least two times a month for a one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, actively supporting your people attend at least one DEI wellness, some kind of event per quarter. Uh, are, you have to require you, you have to attend and complete the required leader, the LeadX or leadership development program. So that attendance was required. And then we use Glenn to do leadership 360s. And so in that platform, you can document your actions. And so we said you need to at least take two actions as a result of this 360. Your people took the time to give you that feedback. What are you doing with it and how can you describe that and so that was like the you know very basic stuff that connected to some of those core behaviors we had rolled out as a part of the leadership development program but like that's the actions you want to see as a result um and so that's what we and and we had i could pull reporting on most of that stuff so darren let me let me stop you and, I, and i'm and i'm smiling almost laughing because you're 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 covering all this ground all this gold like so fast and very nonchalantly and i'm seeing in the chat people are like whoa wait what are those topics how are they doing that and so let me let, let me pause you and say for people so again just to make sure people get it so duck creek is about how many employees roughly so 1800 employees roughly uh got about 425 managers so we're in six countries six yeah. countries right yeah. so thousands of people <laughs> lots of countries Yep. And Darren came in and there was no leadership development <laughs> program at all. And no. so Darren and with his help, Stephanie, who's doing a great job co-leading in the chats here, um, <laughs> stood up the program and and the it's in the chats, you know, DISC, effective feedback, O3s. And what we often think of, it's almost like a phase one. So it's like there's endless number of competencies and topics and advanced things we all should know and do as leaders but this is like okay here's a core like do this and you'll be good as a as a people leader and that was kind of your 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 first big thing was rolling this out and making sure everyone uh, went through it and it was global yeah and then more recently and and you said the key word as you were describing it, you said, what are they doing? What are they actually doing? It's about the behavior. It's not about the knowledge, yeah. right? Yeah. And so again, it's things like, do, do all of their team members have a development goal? Are they doing one-on-ones at least twice a month, you know, every other uh, week? Are they going to the, the, the quarterly events or did they get the training? Um, I love it that you're using you're using Glint. And so this is back to that manager effectiveness. And we had Russ Laraway on many months ago, and this keeps coming up about giving specific feedback to each manager about the behaviors that drive engagement. And so you're saying, are you, did you develop an action plan around, you know, around that or not? So much good stuff. Yeah. But I, so <laughs> I, you know, I geek out on this stuff. So one of the things that comes into my mind, you've got like your core six things you want them to do. That list could have been three things. It could have been 20 things, right? Yeah. So how did you go about that process of deciding, okay, there could be whatever, this is going to be our set that we want to watch. Are they doing these things? Um, so I, largely what we were trying to get down to, because we, we we use Glint also for engagement surveys and we were thinking about doing a manager poll survey. The problem with all of those things you know, um, is that we have roughly 35% of our managers have less than three direct reports. So even if I launch a manager effectiveness survey, asking specific questions on some of these things, those people are never going to get a report. This is a problem. Yeah. Yeah. This is a problem and, and I can't solve it. I don't know yeah, how to solve yeah. it. I've known, and so how do we, unless I just go and literally ask their two direct reports, is their manager terrible or not? Right. <laughs> I don't, it's hard to get that feedback to that person, but what I can, and again, these are all just directional and, you know, to say what are the core actions, the, the the repetitions that should be happening. I can't always speak to the quality of that one-on-one, -on -one, but I can right. at least, you know, like we are capturing our quarterly check-ins as one of the data points I'm pulling and we, we are documenting that in Workday. So I run a report, you know, three weeks after it's supposed to be done and I, and I, and I capture the day and say, who the managers have done this and who have not. Now, again, I wasn't sitting in on that quarterly check-in, but I can go into Workday and I can validate with actual data that says 80% of our managers did that last quarter and 20% didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and so that gives me a data point. It's not, it's one data point, but then if I add that to who did something in the 360, 
who uh, you know, who, who's, who's team members when I run a report and work day have a development goal and have it completed for the year. As you start to then stream all these things together, it starts to show you at least trending to say yeah. who is doing the things that matter to the most or employees and who are the thing, who are the managers that are opting out of those things. And yeah. that's important. It's not going to necessarily, you know, we're still working through the data, right? How do we make sure that, you know, if I've got five, say, you know, if I've got six direct reports, and I get the the quarterly chickens for five of the six. <laughs> Is mm-hmm. that good? Mm-hmm. Um, should they get dinged because they they didn't get the one? And they're, I'm sure there's probably right. lots. Of, there's always exceptions, right? And, but I think so. It's not to say this is a, a black and white field of data that that we're going to determine something. But what we are thinking about, you know, as we go in, we're, we're right now just launch performance management for this for this uh, year this week. Um, our fiscal year ends at the end of August and. So as I'm, you know, talking to, you know, chief people officer, head of HR and our senior leadership to say, you know, as we are thinking about promoting, you know, who are the managers that are getting offered up for promotions this year? Who's getting rated as outstanding? And let's now cross-reference that with this data and say, okay, I see how they've accomplished these business goals. That's awesome. Uh, are they also doing that important duties around leadership and, and leading their teams effectively? Um, and so if they aren't, Right, they're not on the part of their business, but it's like wasteland over here in, in the leadership actions, then that's probably not, we need to question, at least question, ask some questions. And that's what we're using it for this year. We'll see how it evolves and transitions into the coming years. We get better data, figure out where we draw the line in the sand. <laughs> it's a four out of six, five out of six. I don't know. It, yeah. It's it's We're in the early stages. We're like phase one, but like eventually I can make this into like a Power BI dashboard. So a manager should be able to go in any given time and say, how am I scoring Mm -hmm. on these fundamental actions? Because this shouldn't be a secret. Like it shouldn't be a secret list. I I should be able to know that. And I also should be able to say, oh, that's not right. I did complete that. Let me go back and kind of correct that. But I think it's, so we want to make it transparent. Right now I'm kind of like working with, you know, our, my HR team and, and trying to figure out how do we start to leverage this data, but I think it's important that we can actually start to pull all these different data points, put them together in one place that's consumable to say, what trend does this tell us about managers? Right. When I first came to the organization, everyone was saying, we've got a management issue. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? Like quantify that for me. We have 425 managers. Is it four managers we have a problem with? Is it 40 managers, 140 managers? I don't know how to, how, I don't know how to address we have a management issue um so i've started to try to quantify that yeah uh this is this is great and i see we're starting to get questions in the chat i'm gonna um before i call on on uh, do go to those questions if you have a question first i invite you to raise your hand and leave it raised because i'd always love to just have you come on and chat with darren directly if you're uncomfortable or can't that i can certainly read um that uh that question um and but before i go to the questions Another thing, Darren, that you said that I just love, it's that this idea of evaluating managers, not just on the results they're achieving, but how they're getting the results. You know, does it align with our values? Is it a way that boosts the team or not? I've got, I don't know if I have it. Oh, it's behind my head. I've got justice scales on my on my bookshelf because it's the duality of leadership, right? It's it's uh, challenge directly, but care deeply, as Kim Scott likes to say. Uh, uh, be be tough on standards, tender-hearted with people, as Doug Conant, CEO of Campbell Soup, you know, used to say. It's that duality, and so now you're saying, look, someone else is already measuring: Did they hit their sales goals? Did they ship the product on time? How's the quality control department doing? Now, how can we see if they're being a good leader? How are they doing the people part right? And it's so rare, like. And, and again, this is what, you know, I'm always beating that drum. It's like, yes, learning's important, but let's go above and beyond the L and D part of our title and say, it's really about their behavior. So are they doing uh, the behaviors? Where did, uh, where did Kara Fox go? You had your hand up, right? Yes. Right. Sorry, I was there trying to find my unmute. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I'm curious how you hold managers accountable to those behavioral expectations and if you do, um, because I, I mean, it's great that you have them, but then like the people who uh, inevitably say, oh yeah, okay, I'm too busy to, to worry about all that, um, <laughs> which we know happens, uh, what happens with them? 
Yeah, so I think that's where that's where taking the next step. First of all, I would say what I'm trying to do is provide a goal, a platform, and metrics so leaders can hold their direct leaders of leaders can hold their 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 people responsible. So that's their job. My job is to provide them the tools and the data in which to do so, and the context in which to do so. So it's ultimately, you know, my question to you know the senior leaders to say, okay, I've got this data for the first time. We we have some actual data I can give you that's going to help you understand how, what are your leaders actually doing when it comes to their people leader responsibilities. I'm not for sure how you want to weigh that this year. I think it's the first year. So I think this year is kind of going to be more educational, more awareness, like let's try to start to figure it out. And we, we need to, to get some of this data, again, refined and, and figure out where are the gray areas and all that kind of stuff, because there's always gray areas. But I think you know, next year, you know, maybe we think about, again, if we can get a dashboard, make it more transparent to say 20% of your annual performance review is based on this data, right? 80% is your goals, 20% is your leadership responsibilities. Um, you know, you're getting paid, you have a title, it's important. Like this is the most, one of the most important things you're going to do, period, is you have the charge of your people and, and it's not, and it can't be generic. And that's why we're trying to just get, make it as smart as possible. So it's very specific, um, but yeah. So it's ultimately it's the managers, you know, the senior leaders' responsibility of our leaders of leaders. It's their responsibility to hold their people accountable. I'm just trying to give them some better data in which to do so. Yeah, the the um, there there's an incredible power, right? Like you know, if you want to improve something, measure it, and often that's the only thing you have to 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 do. There's um, uh, actually, I have a little story in my new book about goal setting about back when they're building the Panama Canal and running behind, they put in a new uh, leader of, of, of the Panama Canal and they started a daily newspaper for the workers at the Panama Canal. And the only thing, like nobody yelled at anybody to work harder, nobody put them through training to work harder, but the each crew, the, I don't know, amount of dirt they scooped or whatever it was, it was published daily. And all of a sudden, everybody's numbers started to improve. <laughs> the only thing was putting the light on the on the numbers and letting people know we're, we're looking at it. And so this is the first step. And then as, as you said, Darren, like to be able to put it in a, in a dashboard or a Power BI thing where everybody sees their numbers and maybe see how they're doing against other leaders would, would go a long way. Uh, I grew up, I grew up in banking. And so I was a retail branch manager and all that stuff. Like every, every day you got a scoreboard and you can see the entire company, how many checking accounts you sold, how many visit loans accounts you open, what deposits you got, like all of our sales data was fully transparent across the organization. Yep. How is that in each, you know, I think we can get there to maybe to some degree around leadership as well, yeah. but that's kind of the world in which I grew up in. That's great. Anna, you had a question. Yeah, I do. Hi, Darren. So question for you, you're talking about uh, mentioned that your key responsibility or focus is on providing tools that leader of leaders can use. What would you say would be your top three tools that you have just uh, observed that consistently or value, add value and are useful? I mean, I, you know, I think, I think, when it comes to this, the leader of leaders, one of the things we've been again trying to, um, you know, we're doing a lot of things for first here as we're kind of building out our programs here at, at Duck Creek. So, you know, doing for the first time, you know, this year doing talent um, talent reviews, <laughs> right? That's something we had not done here and, and really start to think about succession planning and, and how do we actually truly build a talent pipeline. So, We've had to teach, you know, and and and, and train managers, um, senior leaders who've never done a nine months activity, for example, and really start to think about think about my people in a different kind of frame and context. I think has been uh, is is a great activity for the leader of leaders to start to do. So they really can start to think about who are my superstars, who are my kind of consistent performers that are like super important as well. And, and having that, you know, not everyone's going to be in that top right hand box and that's okay. <laughs> and thinking about how do I, but how I actually started to think about my team in a different frame. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that, that uh, I guess another tool we've been trying to do is again, just try to provide them more frequent data and try to really partner. I partner a lot with my HR partners on supporting them and having really good conversations around understanding what their people are doing and not doing um, when it comes to some of these activities. So I think I have a really good partnership with my HR partners um, and help use them to you know, get these messages out to senior leaders. They're the ones sitting with them all the time anyway. So it's really 
garnering that partnership to say, how do we are, how are we managing talent holistically as a, as, as a company? It's a couple of things off the top of my head. Yeah. Yeah. Carrie, you had a follow-up? Yeah, I actually, this is a question that Renee asked that I didn't want to get lost in the chat here because I was very curious about it too. Um, you had mentioned that you set SMART goals around each of this, the major core behaviors that you had identified and curious of what was the goal you set around accountability and how you measured that? Um, so I didn't, ha I didn't, I couldn't set it. So those goals that I gave you and I, and I can send these to Kevin, you can probably send them out. Uh, you know, so the goals, the, the five things I put on there that I read off, those are the five that I put on there because those are the ones I feel like I could really come up with something that that was measurable or that, you know, a manager, you know, although I can probably probably provide data on four of the five um, by pulling reports that I can pull and have access to uh, at the end of the day, the manager is going to have to write their own self-evaluation. And so they should be providing documentation about what they're doing, just like they are on any other goal. Um, and so uh, I didn't have something around specifically around accountability <laughs> um, that, because I was trying to figure out what could I give, because this is the same goal for every single people leader of this organization. So I had to try to do something that was smart as it could be, but also applicable to all leaders. So that's kind of where I landed. This was V1. <laughs> yeah. I want to bring uh, Dwayne Bess in on this for a second. So Dwayne, <clears throat> this idea of measuring the, the management side, the leadership side of managers, again, you're you, so different lens, your life sciences, often sales leadership. So mm -hmm. what's typical there? Is it just, are they doing their field coaching reports, the FCRs or not? I mean, is your experience that district manager, sales managers are being held accountable for the people leadership stuff? So I think it was two different things there. Um, the FCR can capture results and behaviors, and then it, it can also capture the, the people side of things. But um, I think some organizations do it well. Others, it's more of a check the box. Oh, hey, we have another director of sales training development. What are we going to do? Okay, I'm going to, we need to start doing coaching. It's the coaching that matters, not necessarily the quality of it or what we're actually looking at, right? Mm. So I, I do think that um, when you take a look at the, from life sciences on the pharmaceutical side versus the device side, I'm on the device side, but on the pharmaceutical side and the biotech side, I think they're about 10 years ahead of the mm. device side. Uh, so that they're dialing a little a little stronger and better in terms of not just coaching the coach and making something a little more meaningful, where I think it's a little newer on the device side. And uh, we're just happy to actually sometimes get leaders in the field to actually, mm -hmm. you know, it, they're normally being leveraged as a subject matter expert on negotiation. Yeah, let's bring in the, the regional manager when it's time to negotiate or we need some type of financial forgiveness versus let's bring them in to actually skill up the individual. So um, once again, about 10 years behind in, in the same kind of industry uh, between the pharmaceutical side, biotech and the device side. Yeah, and what you said there, Dwayne, triggered something in my mind, Darren, which is, you know, this is great that we're now measuring like leadership activities. Are they holding one-on-ones? Are they doing things? Mm -hmm. But similar to field coaching reports or field rides, it would be easy to claim you did it when you really didn't, right. or you just kind of phoned right. it in. So there's activity, mm -hmm. but if you measure only activity, the wrong people, not everybody, certain people are going to cheat, right? Cheat it. So you always want to make sure you're still looking at ultimate outcomes. Yes, the performance outcomes, but also things like team engagement. Is the team engaged or not? If you only have less than five direct reports, it's, you usually can't get that score. But I, that's why I think, go back, if you've got an engaged team, whether you've done your coaching conversations or you skipped an 03, okay, like not ideal, but if you've got an engaged team, you're doing, you're doing something right. And we still want to layer in, like we're, we, we have engagement surveys, right? I still look to those engagement surveys, Stephanie, I comb through those and say, okay, at least, you know, uh, where do we have geographic pockets where there's less engagement or le less leadership effectiveness? Are there specific functions, you know, is, how does professional services compare to engineering? And we try to just see, are there trends? Same thing when I did the 360, one of the things that we did was um, look at, you know, ag in aggregate, you know, the 360 is a development tool, it's not a measurement tool per, per se, but we wanted to see, you know, what were the things from the 360s? You know, I took all the competencies and, and put them, you know, at, in aggregate for 375 managers, what ranked them from what best to worst? 
And yeah. then that helps inform us now on what additional, now we've covered the foundations, right? What should we go back and maybe do additional workshops on or, you know, micro learnings or whatever it may be on um, how we are moving the needle from a 360 perspective, which is, you know, I do have, you know, all the leaders in that, um, but also is the, you know, it's a, you, you want to take all these data points and continue to see what do we see as we kind of put them all together and, and what yeah. does that tell us? Is there something that's popping up as either particularly strong or particularly like odd or, or, or kind of an you know, exception? Yeah, I, and I'm I'm curious for the the group in the chat, maybe like we're just hearing everybody on Workday. I know Workday has been big for a while, but is everybody else like uh, on Workday and are you using Workday to track like O3s or things like that or not there yet? Dwayne, you, you, you're you moving to Workday, aren't you at Hologic? Right now, um, it, right now we're, um, we are, we, we're trying to move to a lot of things quite mm -hmm. honestly, but you know, um, you, you said something, Kevin, that you know made me think. I actually, I'm a huge fan of people kind of uh, putting the data in there and it being inaccurate. Okay, like, hey, they may lie. I love that because it creates so much transparency. I love it. Like, let's put it. They're going to lie on it. Perfect. Let them lie because what happens is when you have this activity and there's a disconnect of the activity and the results. Mm. Now you have information to have good conversations on. Right. So now we can coach the managers or the managers of the managers in terms of how can someone have these O3s, right? Yeah. Have have the O3s that are meaningful and they, they're checking all these boxes, yet there's a lack of of um of results. I mean it just it doesn't work. Right. So I, I love that aspect where you can really dig in and unearth true transparency. I mean, I would say there's other performance enabled systems out there that are probably, you know, we're using Workday because that's <laughs> what we're using, right? So we capture our goals in there. Uh, we've kind of figured out how to make it work for quarterly check-ins. We aren't using it to document one-on-ones, um, but we are using it for a formal quarterly check-in and we're using it for annual performance review. And it's also where we capture goals. So it's, we're leveraging what we have right now. Again, it's not maybe as elegant as some of the solutions out there that can lay over a Workday. Uh, that can capture those one-on-one -on -one coaching conversations and give you even more kind of like it shows you more trending and 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 it's probably a, a maybe a little prettier <laughs> uh, solution, but it's what we had and and so um, for now it's it's at least again getting us a starting point on this. Montana Johnson says the state of Washington uses no such technology with a frowny face. And I'm thinking uh, Montana, there's a lot of people that would think that's a smiley face. Like <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to use that kind of technology. <laughs> Maybe once it's settled in, usually the, the integrations are uh, really, um, really crazy. Um, we only have a few minutes left. So we're going to skip the break, the final breakout on this month's uh, session, a reminder to everyone who does want to hang out, ask some more questions about this topic, or just chat in general about anything. Um, we do the after party, you know, uh, we, we stick around a little bit later. Um, it won't be super long this time because I do have to do um, another Forbes interview at the top of the hour to get ready for, but, um, you know, we'll, we will uh, hang out past um, the half hour. Um, Darren, what do you, uh, mm -hmm. as, as if I don't know, but um. What are you and Stephanie and colleagues working on and thinking about for the rest of this year and going into next year to take this to the next level? Yeah, so we've we've transitioned now to the BAU program. So we got like all newly hired, newly promoted manager. We're kind of restarting a new kind of core six, you know, six month kind of program. So every three months we're we're uh, launching a new cohort. So however many new managers are newly promoted, newly hired are going into rolling into that program. So they're all getting covered with the basics. Um, but then I think next year we're looking at or the, going this next year, we're thinking about how do we start to offer some more niche programs. So we I think we're gonna probably pilot some kind of first line manager, kind of like high potential manager program. So 10, 15, 20 managers that are handpicked, selected by senior leadership to go more through a nine month program uh, that can really, they, we're looking at be our, our future directors and senior directors of this company. So now they've got the basics, like how do we give them some really more hands-on kind of uh, attention and um, really show that we're investing in their future because we look to, look, look to them to be the, the future senior leaders of this organization. Um, also looking at um, coming out of talent review, how do we really do good individual development plans for these people coming out? Mm -hmm. you know, typically right now, I think we'll just be focusing on director and above, um, but like 
do we bring in executive coaches? Like yeah. what's, what, what's the, I, I think really doing a good job this year, trying to figure out that they all have concrete actions to take and how we're going to measure those things and how can we support them um, through maybe a couple of different kind of programs, but executive coaches is one of the things I'm looking at for those smaller, much salt, smaller population, yep. but need more individualized plans. That's great. I, uh, we don't have time for this, but you know, your colleague Stephanie put in the chat that she says, you know, one of your versions of the new, the Panama Canal newsletter is that she's um, placing the progress reports in a team's channel for each cohort. Yeah. I didn't mm -hmm. even realize that, Darren. Yeah. So it's like every cohort's got their own channel with visibility into who's progressing. Have you yeah. seen that oh, help true. at all since uh, rolling that out? Oh yeah. I, 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 Cause we, you know, we had to create like what's graduating criteria, right? So right. we had to kind of make sure we had defined what does a graduate of the program look like and then be able to provide the data so people if they didn't have weren't meeting it because we set the expectation you need to graduate yeah <laughs> so we had to be able to provide some transparent reporting on what that was so if they had not completed an activity on a specific topic or had not attended a call and they were supposed to they just they there was a one place they could all go and just see up-to-date data and stephanie refreshes it every couple of weeks and then we as soon as someone graduates we send them a a recognition badge that we created and um, we also are adding that to their talent profile in workday so nice. i can look at any leader who's going through talent review and say have they completed their leadership development program so it's yep. transitioning from recognition to it's part of their resume and workday really um and so but having the the data so anyone can go out and, and look at it is helpful because uh it's just you know they can self-serve love it Hey, Darren, thanks so much for uh, spending time with us and sharing all of that. I could tell like comments were going crazy. So you had a lot of valuable stuff. You're going to get hit up, I'm sure, on LinkedIn like crazy with more questions. Um, before we go to the after party, Dwayne, any final thoughts before we go uh, into our weekend? Yes, sir. I would say my uh, quote of the month for us in August is this, that your job description and your title are essentially the lowest level of your influence. And I'll say that again, your job description and your title are the absolute lowest level of your influence. So let's dare to do great things this month. Fantastic. Thank you everyone for investing in each other, not just yourselves in each other. Hope you guys have a great weekend. For those of you who participated in my book launch, I hope I see you on the webinar tonight. Thanks for all that effort. And we'll see you next month.